Financial Bunny TV. Hey guys, my name is Nicolette Mashile. I'm also known as The Financial Bunny. Welcome to The Financial Bunny TV. Today we're talking all things why I think that budgeting is one of the most underrated personal finance management strategies. Like if you want to manage your money and you want to manage it really well, that is where you need to start. You have to budget. I don't think there is anybody that is managing their finances, building wealth and doing really, really well who does not budget. But some people even throw a sprinkle of magic called forecasting. And that's how they manage to, be, to really, really get it right. And I'm telling you, it doesn't matter who you speak to. Even if they might not necessarily be budgeting on a piece of paper like the rest of us need to, many people are budgeting. And for some people, because they've understood how budgeting works, sometimes it's a quick budgeting sum in their head and it makes sense for them. But for some of us, we do need to start at zero because the baby must crawl before the baby can walk. Now, before I get into this video, do remember that none of my videos constitute as financial advice. If you are looking for financial advice, please speak to somebody that is certified and registered with the FSCA. So I got a message the other day. Somebody said to me on, uh, on my DM, Nicolette, um, what advice would you give somebody that is about to miss a payment? Or in fact, yes, it was, what advice would you give somebody who's going to miss their car payment? And I wanted to understand, what do you mean they're going to miss the car payment? Is it like an intentional missing the car payment? Or because there is no money to be able to service that debt. And the person was like, no, there is no money to service the debt. In actual fact, they've already missed a couple of car payments before. And I said, dude, that's the person budget. And that's when I started realizing that you would know you're going to miss a car payment if you budgeted. In fact, you would know even before the month or the date of the missed payment or when the payment is supposed to go through your bank account that you're going to miss the payment, right? Um, people will say, yeah, but obviously you know. But sometimes some reasons for missing that payment, maybe because maybe you didn't get your salary on time or your salary didn't come through. But if you are somebody who gets their salary on time and you know you're going to get a certain amount of money, even before that date, you already know. Why? Because on your budget, it tells you that despite the amount of money that you're going to get at the end of the month through your income, you're not going to have enough money to be able to pay for that. So that's also one of the biggest reasons why it's important to budget because that allows you to track your spending. But for today's purpose, I want to use a business as a reference or an example of why budgeting is important. Now, if you work for any company, right, one of the biggest things that you will never do is to mess up the budget of a company. One, because there's a thing called accountability. You've got to account for what and how you use a business's money, right? <laughs> and, and, and it's so funny because somehow you, you probably are somebody who is very good at doing that for somebody else's money and somebody else's business. But when it comes to your own personal finances, you become lackluster about how you actually manage those finances, right? But that's because there's a level of accountability, right? There's a level of accounting for what it is that you do with that money. The second part, obviously, is because there's probably policies that are put in place. So whereas in your house, you can decide, oh my goodness, I'm going to fly to Zgoopy Zgoopy. And you know what? Actually, I'm tired of flying economy, so I'm going to fly business. Whereas if it's a business trip, the, policy, the company might have policies that say, if it's a one-hour trip, it's got to be economy. If it's a two-hour trip, economy flexible. If it's a four-hour trip, that's when we go to business class. If it's a 10-hour trip, that's when we go to first class, right? So because there are policies that are put in place, it then helps in protecting the forecast of what the business has forecasted. That's why I was saying those who are really good at managing their finances, they often sprinkle this forecasting part or portion of budgeting. So there's budgeting on one side, then there's forecasting on the other side. Forecasting in the personal finance space is goal setting. So you've got these goals of how you want to manage your finances. You've got these elaborate goals of what type of lifestyle you want to live, the type of car you want to drive, the type of house you want to live in. And then you use the budget to be able to achieve those goals. Now, in a business setting, what usually would happen is that you would sit down and forecast what the business wants to achieve, right? And then you would use the budget to be able to support that. But you go an extra mile by putting in policies 
in the company to ensure that there is no wastage, there's no leakage. So we're being financially frugal in the business to make sure that the business stays profitable, which is another thing. There's no way if you are the manager of finance or you are head of department, you're going to go over the budget because one, it actually is your job to make sure that the business is profitable and that's being so that you are actually financially accountable. Two, you realize that if you don't take care of the business's finances, there may not be a job for you. So the job security part falls away. But it's the same thing in your business, in personal finances. In personal finances, you've got to look at it as your financial future kind of falls away if you don't take care of your current finances. So, the, and this is the biggest problem with personal finance and doing the right thing when it comes to personal finances because often the result is not instant. If you do this in a business setting or in a job setting, you probably may just extend the risk of losing your job, right? But in personal finances, you may get away with it for many years of mismanaging your personal finances, but eventually it's going to bite you in the backside. Eventually, it is going to catch up with you. So it's very important to think about it in this business setting. But I want to bring another example. In fact, I was having a conversation with the guy who does the voice. Where's the guy? He does the voice. Where's Amatomani? I think that's um, his surname. Maybe I, mean, I think I might have his surname wrong, but I think that's his surname. He's the guy who's the voice of Dal Direct and uh, various other voices, right? And so we're talking about this gin. So I've created this gin. It's called Anasa. Right, um, and I was talking about like I don't have a commercial model for it. I really am a I'm a gin consumer, so I thought why not make my own gin and consume my own gin brand instead of buying from somebody else, right? Um, but he asked if if I were to go commercial, what were my thoughts? And I thought, oh no, let me start off in the smaller countries. And then he was saying, well, it's it's a bit dangerous to think about it that way because ultimately you don't own the means of production. And, and we're still having that conversation because he was like, so what happens if, for instance, the, the guys who distill your wine say to you, one of your berries that you are part of the wine, the price has skyrocketed, and then they change your pricing on producing the actual gin. So what does that mean? It's going to eat into my profit margins, right? Because I probably would have had like a distribution deal with a distributor. Let's say we've priced the gin at $2.99. All of a sudden, um, that maybe, let's say, gave me a a 15% uh, profit margin. And then all of a sudden, the, the distillery, because they own the means of production, they change some prices and all of a sudden now my my, my margin or my profit margin becomes even smaller. So because you don't own the means of production, sometimes it's difficult. And this is the reality with a lot of us. Because we don't own the means of production, it means that we have to be overly strict with how we manage every single cent that comes into our businesses, every single cent that comes into our bank account. And I'll give you an example. Say, for instance, you're an Uber driver. If you go anywhere and you read the Uber case, the business model. They'll tell you how profitable the model is. Why? Because it is human nature to look at the big numbers. So for instance, in South Africa, in Johannesburg, it, they could say to you, you could make 10 trips a day. An average trip is 150 rand. Average trip is 150 rand, and that means every single day you could potentially make 1,500. If you're making 1,500, you work four days in a week, which many Uber drivers don't because it's a full-time job. They work seven, six, seven days, right? But let's, let's, let's be very modest with the example. Let's say you work only four days. That means you're making uh, 6,000 rand every single week. 6,000 multiplied by four weeks is, of course, 24,000 rand. So you could potentially make 24,000 rand every single month from one car. Now imagine if you've got two, three, four, five, six cars and you're scaling the business, right? But one thing people don't talk about is that there's a difference between revenue, your salary, how much the business makes, what goes into the business account versus the profit. What is left in your business account? What is your disposable income? And that's why the rule that goes, it's not about how much you make, it's about how much you keep. And where are you keeping it is then how we grow wealth. That's the important part. The important part is not making money. It's not difficult to make money. We can all make money. There's something. I can literally tomorrow go buy a bunch of cameras, buy them for 10,000 rand a camera, sell them for 9.5, not account for all of my expenses, or, or sorry, sell them for 11,000 rand, but not fully account for the expenses that go into me being able to bring these cameras in into the country, sell them, and I could be making a loss. So I could sell all 10 of them at 11,000 rand and make 110,000. It could go through my bank account. But how much of it did I make? How much of it did I keep? And after keeping it, 
How much of it am I de-investing and reinvesting into something else? And it goes back to your personal finances too. Your salary comes in. If you don't carefully manage the living expenses, if you don't carefully manage your debt to income ratio, you are not going to have a very big disposable income to work with to be able to grow your money. So then what do people do? Because then they say, okay, we're not getting paid enough. Then they go into side hustles. But they make the same mistake in the side hustle that they're making with their income. So in the side hustle, I go into Uber, I do this, and I'm told I'm going to earn 24,000 rand a month. But let's say, for instance, Uber in South Africa, the car has to be three years or, or younger, right? Or, yeah, so it can't be three years, older than three years, basically. So for many people, they're financing that car. So there's a finance cost, which is a liability to a financier, a lender, a bank, whatever, your creditor, right? Then there is maintenance costs. Then there's fuel costs. Then you potentially sometimes have a driver because you probably are not driving the car yourself. If it's a side hustle, somebody else is doing it for you. All of those costs start to add up, right? Now that 24,000 Rand is no longer a viable 24,000 Rand every single month. But because 24,000 is coming in every single month and you actually can get by every single month, you get by every single month. And then there's those unexpected costs that pop up. Because what do many of us don't do is we also don't keep an emergency fund. So in your personal finances, you don't keep an emergency fund. So yes, you might get away with your, with your income every month and you can still pay for the things that you need to pay for every single month. And then there may be some, a little bit of money left, but then, no, then one month something else comes up. On one month something else comes up. You think you are surviving and you're doing fine. And that is okay. But eventually it catches up with you. Same thing in your, in, 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 in your side hustle. You're running a side hustle. It doesn't have an emergency account. One month something happens and it clears up all that little bit of profit that you're actually making. But in your head, from an aesthetics point of view, a huge sum of money still went into your money. Weza calls it having a conveyor belt. Basically, yangena, yapuma. Yangena, yapuma. At the end of the day, we sit there and we say, but how much did you make? How much did you keep? And the next step after keeping is, where are you putting that money? How are you growing the money? It happens also within rental investment properties. A lot of people don't actually sit down before they sign the deal with the bank if they're buying it on bond. They don't sign with a mathematics equation right next to them to say, I've worked out a potential rental yield and not just any rental yield, the net rental yield. The amount of money after I've paid for everything. I mean, I sit on a 1 million rand apartment, two bedroom apartment, with a 9,000 rand monthly rental. And that sounds great to people. People are like, yo, you're pulling 9,000 rand per month as a rental. And they think it's exciting because my, my property is, is paid up. But the reality is, on 9,000 rand, the real profit I'm probably making is 3.5. Because the city of Johannesburg. There's insurance, there's tax, and then there are levies. Because it's in a sectional title. So all of these little things you've got to keep in mind, keep at the back of your mind to say, what does it actually look like? And the one way you're going to get it right is by budgeting. Because a budget will tell you whether the goals you're trying to achieve are realistic or not. And a budget is a detailed plan that tracks your expenses, that will throw a red flag at you and say, bah, you're not going to make it this month. That is why budgeting is so underrated. And I know the reason why many people don't budget is because it's a tedious process. It feels tedious. It feels like you are restricting yourself. I mean, oh my goodness, life is not so stressful. Take it easy, you know? You can take it easy in any other space, not your finances. You can take it easy in any other space, not your finances. Because the only way you can make and grow your finances is by making sure you've got a disposable income. And then every single month you take a bit of that disposable income and you put it in something that it can grow in. But even when you're choosing those investments, those mutual funds, look at the fees. What are the commission fees? What are the tax fees? Uh, 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 obligations. Look at those things. Where are you putting your money? What is the cost associated with running those types of assets? And maybe that's my next video. The assets that we buy that actually cost so much more money than what they actually make you. So what's the point of actually buying them? But I'm going to leave it here and pocket here.
Do remember, none of my videos constitute as financial advice. If you are looking for financial advice, please speak to somebody that is certified and registered with the FSCA. And, the, and, and, and maybe let me leave you with a tool. There are apps that allow you to budget, that can help you with your budgeting. There are apps that can help you. You don't need to even do the traditional old ways of budgeting. There are various tools that can assist you with budgeting. A simple Excel spreadsheet will help you with budgeting. But you've got to budget and you've got to be pedantic about every single expense that you've got. And that's how you end up knowing what plan to make. But if you constantly are just living in this loop, you are in a loop. Money comes in, money goes out. Money comes in, money goes out. Money comes in, money goes out. One day, something is going to come in and short circuit that loop. And then you're sitting with the problem. Then you're sitting with the problem. So let's fix that. I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye.